All right, well, once again, thank you so much for attending our first presentation on our diversity speaker series. This one is with Jordi Yeager, The Ground We Stand On, and everyone is muted uh, for the presentation. If you have any questions or comments, uh, you may put them in the chat and we'll attend to those after Jordi's finished. But before Jordi starts, we have a few announcements and I'd like to introduce to you um, our Executive Director, Peter Thompson. Thank you, Carolyn, for uh, leading us and thank you everybody for being here. I have the great honor of being the executive director here at the Center at Belvedere for over 20 years now, formerly known as the Senior Center, and we're really thrilled to be kicking off uh, this series. The Center's mission is to provide holistic wellness programs that research has shown for decades are the key ingredients for people to age well. In addition to holistic wellness, we value, uh, our values include diversity and inclusion, excellence and community impact. In align with our mission and values, tonight we're very pleased to be launching our second series of Building a More Inclusive Community, Local Voices on Diversity, which we launched last fall and are happy to be bringing back in a different format here in 2020. Each night of this series is free and open to all people and all ages, um, so please tell your friends, uh, presuming that you're having a, a worthwhile experience tonight, and I'm confident you will with Jordy's talk. And these evenings are all free and open to all because the center does a lot of programming that is open to all ages and open to all people, and it's important for us to be able to do that for particularly hot, important topics, and certainly equity and diversity and inclusion are important in our community today, and we're very pleased to open this up to all comers. It's also important to note that this is free because all of our speakers uh, are providing their services pro bono. Thank you, Jordi, and to everybody in advance, and because volunteers have done so much of this work, uh, including my good friend Enid and all of our diversity and inclusion um, committee. In August 2017, and then again with all the killings um, here in 2020, uh, has clearly opened up a lot of longstanding wounds in our country and certainly here in our community. And along with COVID-19's uh, extraordinarily negative impacts on people, uh, older adults and people of color, it certainly has brought about also the clear exposure of the deep disparities based on ageism and racism in our country and in our society. As any individual or organization paying attention in America today, I and the center have again, once again this year taken stock. We've reflected, we've listened, we've communicated with a lot of different community leaders and trying to consider what part we have, what part of the problem we may be, what part of the solution we must be, and what role we will take to not only build bridges for diversity and inclusion, but the work that we will do to be a more anti-racist organization and to fight systemic racism here in the greater Charlottesville community. Indeed, the center is committed to the intentional and ongoing work this will take because we know it's not just one series and one speaker. So it's gonna be a very holistic action plan that the center is developing to create ongoing programming and partnerships such as this and to work towards a more equitable community. I know you came to hear our speaker and not me, so I'm happy to have now to introduce our speaker. My great pleasure to introduce you to my friend Enid Krieger, who's played such a lead role in developing this series um, to introduce Jordy. Enid? Thank you, Peter. Thank you very much. And good evening, everybody. It's really, really nice to see all of you. There's so many of you. This is, this is totally different from, any, from anything that I've ever done before. Um, but particularly, I'd like to extend a huge thank you to Carolyn Merrick, our host, for helping us make this happen. I could not have done this, or any of us, without her help. You know, we're all facing so many major challenges today, so many issues, and racism is sadly front and center of all of those issues. I find, um, in my short time with the Center of Belvedere, I find the Center to be a very caring, community-owned resource. And in that capacity, we know that we must play a role in overcoming any issues that divide our community. Our Diversity and Inclusion Committee, of which I'm a member, believes that one way to help is to provide the means for people to get to know and understand each other just a little bit better. This speaker series is designed to do just that. So as you listen to our speaker this evening and those who will speak over the next five Wednesdays, I hope that you will listen with an open mind because we're a very small community with open wounds. It's really time to heal those wounds. Um, you just got all the instructions from Carolyn in terms of um, the number of us so that we can only ask questions via chat. 
And so several of us will be monitoring that. You can use the chat box at the bottom. Um, the other thing that you heard about already is that your opinions are very, very important to us. So at the conclusion of the presentation, please stay live for a short time so that you can complete a brief survey. This survey will allow us to improve our programs and identify where action steps are needed to improve our own internal processes. Please be honest, it doesn't matter if you hurt our feelings, this will help us <laughs> in the future. And if you should think of a question or comment after the Zoom has ended, you can feel free to contact um, Judy Gardner or Carolyn or me or anybody that you see um, from the center. Now, some of us are learning and others have always known that racism is real and that Charlottesville's history includes systemic disparities in too many areas, but particularly in housing. Over the three years, speaker Jordi Yeager, is, who is a Digital Humanities Fellow at the Jefferson School African American Heritage Center, has been involved in a project which he founded called the Mapping Seaville Project. During this time, he's obtained thousands of property records from the city and the county, and these have helped to establish a historical context for our current housing landscape. Jordi is a native of Charlottesville. He's a graduate of Charlottesville High School. He earned his bachelor's in Sanskrit and his master's in journalism from Boston University. And for the past 12 years, he's lived and worked as a journalist here in Charlottesville and in Washington, DC. Jordi's work focuses on issues of race and equity and has been published by National Public Radio, The New Yorker, The Columbia Journalism Review, and many state and regional news outlets. This evening, he'll walk us through the history of local racist housing policies that have created the lasting legacies, legacies that we live with today. And I can tell you that of all the information that I've learned about Charlottesville in the 20 years I've been here, this is the most eye-opening. So please welcome Jordi Yeager. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Enid. That was a wonderful, wonderful preamble. Um, I'm, uh, I'm excited to see everybody here. Can you, can I, can I get a thumbs up just to make sure everybody can hear me okay? Okay, good. Um, I will share my screen so you don't have to spend too long. But as you can see, I'm, uh, I'm at the Heritage Center. Uh, it, is, it is just I this evening, but um, Dr. Douglas is here in spirit, of course. And, uh, and again, just thank you for, for, for coming and for being here. Let me see if I can share my screen. There we go. Okay. So as, as Enid um, alluded to and, and, and really zeroed in on, um, you know, one of the great joys that I have found as a journalist in Charlottesville is, um, is learning. And it is really what draws me time and time again um, back out to talk to people uh, into archives to read um, ancient uh, tomes and, and manuscripts and documents. Um, and one of the great, uh, the great joys in doing all of that learning is getting to share it. Um, and so I want to just take uh, at the very front of all of this, just take a, a moment to acknowledge where a lot of this information that uh, at least the, the first half of uh, what I'll be sharing with you came from. Um, and that was really through the tremendous work of Steve Thompson and Ben Ford. Um, so Steve has since left, but together they ran uh, the Rivana Archaeological Services uh, organization and, and really have done a tremendous amount of work preserving African American history in this area. Um, they have done all of the, uh, the work on the grave sites at the Daughters of Zion Cemetery in Charlottesville and um, in Ivy Creek out past Almore High School um, and as we'll talk about uh, the area where the center is uh, currently. Um, the other source of information is Freedom Has a Face, and it's a, a dissertation by Kurt Van Dack that he turned into a book, um, and it's got a, just an immense amount of information about free people of color uh, who lived and built much of this area uh, prior to the Civil War. Um, and it's a history that doesn't get talked about nearly enough, um, but it's a history that still is, is very much, you know, uh, half told um, at best. Um, and so without their work, I, I wouldn't be uh, here sharing much, if any, of this with you, um, only because the, the records are really buried. 
this has not been a history that has been prioritized. Um, it's not been a history that uh, has been widely disseminated. And so um, I, on their shoulders, I definitely stand. Um, I should also say that this is, is built on uh, first and foremost, the um, oral history and the anecdotal experiential realities of many members of these families that I'll be, I'll be welcoming you to. Um, and some of those are dear friends. Uh, of mine and, and of Dr. Douglas's. Um, and so it's with their permission and with, uh, with their uh, guidance that a lot of this is able to be shared as well. Um, so without further ado, I'll just kind of set the stage for you. Um, this is a, a panel from the new exhibit uh, that went up at the Jefferson School of African American Heritage Center um, about, about nine months ago. Um, and it, it shows you just uh, chronologically from 1790 to 1860, um, what the population sizes were for the surrounding Albemarle County. Um, and so this is looking at white and uh, free, free black people are not registered in these numbers. Um, and so those are found uh, up in the upper right hand corner. Um, that's a, a, a tally that has been taken from Kurt Von Dach's book um, that looks at that growing population of uh, free people of color. Um, but of course, the other blue column there next to the white column uh, is the enslaved population. And you see that as soon as, uh, as, as, as recent as 1810, that population actually uh, surpasses the white population. And that's something that I think a lot of people, um, you know, who who may not know this history uh, very well, that they they are surprised that that is indeed the majority of the population here, um, and that continues to be the case all the way up until uh, Liberation and Freedom Day uh, in 1865. And so um, the population that is really, uh, you know, in your backyard, so to speak, um, is that free population, um, and so surrounding all throughout Albemarle County are plantations. Um, and the exhibit here at the Heritage Center actually goes into that a fair amount as well. Um, not just Monticello, but um, you know, more than 100 plantations in, in Albemarle County, all of which are enslaving uh, these tens of thousands of people um, and their, their, their whole family networks. Um, but uh, interacting and intermingling with all of these plantations uh, are free people of color who are owning property, who are using the courts, um, who are marrying, um, who are going through um, the the uh, traditional means of living life uh, in terms of farming, in terms of selling uh, produce or commerce or, or their, even their labor, their skills. Um, and it's that, uh, that legacy that is literally in the backyard of the center. Um, and so one of those families, um, you can see, uh, really starts to uh, take hold in 1788. Um, and so this is a free woman of color named Amy Farrow, and it's that pink uh, polygon there in the center of, of your screen. Um, and she buys 224 acres of land. Uh, and this is adjoining uh, the Thomas Carr property. Thomas Carr, of course, inherited a lot of land, um, upwards of 10,000 acres uh, or more, I believe, um, and uh, coming from a patent. And um, Dunlora is adjoining it on the uh, eastern side. And uh, of course, what's now Ryle Road is there on the western side. Um, and it kind of straddles uh, several bodies of, of water, uh, several creeks um, and, and rivers. Um, and then on the, the north, you have Robert Lewis, um, which was a, a well-known white family as well. So kind of surrounding it on all sides are large holdings of white property ownership. Um, and in the middle, you have this 224-acre tract of, uh, of Amy Farrow's. Um, she uh, has several children, um, and they, um, they come from uh, a couple different lines. Um, and... Let me see if I can go to the next slide. Um, this, uh, this next slide is looking at one of her sons, um, Zachariah Bowles. Uh, he ends up marrying Critta Hemmings. And so Critta Hemmings, that last name probably sounds familiar. She is uh, a sister of um, Sally Hemmings, probably the more familiar to most people of the Hemmings children. Um, this is Elizabeth Hemmings' uh, children. Um, and Critta marries Zachariah Bowles, um, and, uh, and together they have, have children as well. Um, this is, uh, this is uh, the property descending through that second generation into the Hemmings and, and um, Bowles family lines. Um, here in the bottom left, you actually see the year after Thomas Jefferson uh, dies that Critta Hemmings is manumitted. 
um, and so so that means that she was freed. Um, and this is uh, this is something that um, did not happen with a, a lot of the people that Jefferson enslaved, um, but it did happen mostly to people that were directly related to him. So directly um, in line with um, either you know were his cousins or uh, nieces, nephews, um, uh, sometimes even children. Um, and uh, so this is uh, Krita Hemings' uh, Freedom Papers, and these are on record at, um, at the Albemarle County Courthouse. Um, Zachariah Bowles uh, actually fought in the American Revolution. Um, and so this is something that I think a lot of people have a misconception about as well, um, that there, there were not free black people who were fighting in the American Revolution. Um, but that, that simply just is not true. Um, and he wasn't alone. Another uh, American Revolutionary uh, veteran was named Charles Barnett. Um, and he marries another of Amy Farrow's uh, children, uh, a, a woman by the name of Lucy Bowles. Um, Another one of his uh, of Amy Farrell's children, Nancy Bowles, uh, marries uh, another uh, Revolutionary War veteran named Robert Battle Sr. Um, in 1793. Um, what's interesting about Zachariah Bowles, uh, her her son who marries Krita Hemings, is that um, he's not only operating as as a farmer, as a free man of color um, in the late 18 uh, 18th century, but um, he's going to court. Um, in fact, many of these. Um, these individuals are going to court for various reasons, some to file lawsuits, um, some to, um, in the case of Zachariah Bowles, he actually petitions the court for a firearm um, because he is a veteran, he's a soldier, um, and the court grants him a uh, license to use a firearm, which was very unique, uh, especially in the early 1800s when he does that. Um, and then you, you hop forward into 1844 and you see that 224 acres start to shrink down. And that's largely uh, because some of the family is moving away. Um, it's also because they're selling off some of that property. And so you have 93 and a half acres right there in the center um, of that slide. Um, this is, uh, this is approximately when Krita passes away as well. She dies in, eight, in 1850. Um, and then the land passes to, um, to the, several other of the Bowles children, Stephen, Peter, and Edward Bowles. And you see that start to break up uh, some of that land right there as well. Um, again, this is all in the back. Uh, if you kept going down, uh, past, uh, down Belvedere past the center, um, this is where a lot of that property was. Um, you also see the first mention of Free State. Um, as a uh, terminology to describe this neighborhood, this community, this, uh, these, these various tracts of land. Um, this was known uh, very much colloquially as Free State, but it first shows up in the, in the records um, in the mid-19th century um, as well. Um, and then in uh, 1902, so hop forward another 50 years, you see that um, those tracts of land start to get broken up even more. Um, and so you see the Bowles family is still retaining ownership of some of that, but then uh, so are uh, the Cole family, the Brown family, the Lewises. Um, it's starting to get broken up um, a little bit and a little bit more. Um, now, a lot of these names may sound familiar to you. Um, because uh, they have been adopted uh, as street signs. Um, and so I don't know if you've taken a, a, a tour, a driving tour around uh, the greater Belvedere neighborhood, but you will see um, Bowles Alley, you'll see Barnett Street, um, you'll see Farrow, uh, I believe it's Lane, uh, Free State Road, Free State Drive, um, uh, Farrow Drive, Gibbons Lane. Uh, we'll talk about Gibbons a little bit later on. Um, but all of these names uh, are very present still in that area. Um, there's also a commemorative display that is set up um, uh, within the neighborhood as well. A great deal of this work that both Steve and Ben did um, was, uh, was put into exhibit form there and uh, as well as these, um, these placards to mark the space. There is still a headstone uh, for Mary Bowles. Um, it is the last remaining headstone. There's, there's one other field stone that doesn't have any writing as well, but, um, but that cemetery is preserved and it has some benches there. I imagine that some of you have probably been there. Um, now, there's something else about this breakup of property um, in the, in the mid-19th century. Um, that property to the left on your screen, um, John R. Jones. And John R. Jones 
I don't know if you're familiar with the name, um, but you're probably familiar with his house. Um, he, if you see on the lower half of this slide, um, that giant house, that's called a house called Social Hall. And that's right there on the corner of East Jefferson Street and uh, 2nd Street. Um, so catty corner to the uh, Albemarle Charlottesville Historical Society, uh, right across the street from the Lee statue uh, in the park there. Um, and this was where John R. Jones uh, enslaved people and lived with his family. Um, and one of those people that he enslaved there was a man named Peter Fawcett. Um, and Peter Fawcett um, actually uh, escaped several times. Um, he would be captured and brought back, um, but ultimately gained his freedom and um, went on to write about it. Um, and I'd just like to read a, a quote from one of his, uh, his memoirs that he's recounting his experience there um, as, uh, as, as a captive of John R. Jones as an enslaved man. He says, when I was sold to Colonel Jones, I took my books along with me. One day I was kneeling before the fireplace spelling the word Baker when Colonel Jones opened the door and I shall never forget the scene as long as I live. What have you got there, sir? Were his words. I told him, if I ever catch you with a book in your hands, 39 lashes on your bare back. He took the book and threw it into the fire, then called up his sons and told them that if they ever taught me, they would receive the same punishment. But they helped me all they could, as did his daughter. Among my things was a copy book that my father gave me and which I kept hid in the bottom of my trunk. I used to get permission to take a bath and by the dying embers, I learned to write. The first copy was this sentence, art improves nature. So Peter Fawcett writes this, he, he's, he's dropping, um, a lot of information within those two paragraphs, but, um, but, but some that is very essential to kind of understanding how uh, free people and enslaved people moved and operated both before and after Liberation and Freedom Day. Um, and so um, Peter Fawcett learns how to read. Um, that in itself uh, was a tremendous feat because that positioned him to do a lot of things and move in the world in a way that very, very few people uh, in his situation were able to. Um, but he also extends that that tool, that, that literacy to a man named Berkeley Bullock. And Berkeley Bullock, um, there, there are many people who have studied uh, his life and uh, some of his descendants are, uh, are still frequently coming back to the area. Um, but one of the things that Berkeley Bullock goes on to do is found something called the Piedmont Industrial Land Improvement Company. And the Piedmont Industrial Land Improvement Company uh, was a cooperative of black men who uh, saw to it that they needed to pool their resources in order to uh, collectively buy property throughout Charlottesville um, and then sell that property uh, through a shareholding mechanism uh, to other black families um, so that that property could pass through black hands um, because, uh, and we'll talk about this in a minute, um, why this was formed and, and the necessity that it was formed out of. Um, but without that tool, without that literacy, um, he, he would not have been able to do that. He would not have been positioned to be able to, to do that. Um, this is one of my favorite articles here on the right side. Um, this is from the, plant, the Richmond Planet um, announcing the formation of, uh, of the Piedmont Industrial Land Improvement Company. And it kind of goes through in the middle of that and names all of the officers and, uh, you know, the secretary, the treasurer. Uh, and then at the very end, it says, we are coming, uh, which is very ominous and, and, and telling because uh, come they did. They bought uh, dozens and dozens of property. This is how Fifeville, a uh, neighborhood here in the center of Charlottesville on the south side of the railroad tracks was formed. It's also um, how parts of Gospel Hill uh, on into 10th and Page and Star Hill um, and into Vinegar Hill. Um, these are all the beginning formations of those historically black neighborhoods uh, was, uh, and, and even Rose Hill uh, as well on the north side of Preston there. Um, one of the other things that uh, Peter Fawcett mentions in that quote that I relayed to you um, uh, was something about his father, that his father had given him a book. Um, now, Peter's father, father lives uh, in this house right here. And this is situated on the downtown mall where, where Main Street was, um, still is, but, but it was a thoroughfare during that time. Um, and it's on the corner of 2nd Street. Um, so just one block, actually two blocks away from where Peter was enslaved uh, was his father, Joseph Fawcett. Now, Joseph Fawcett, let me see if I, I can 
well, no, I guess you can't see me. Um, so Joseph Fawcett was, uh, was the son of Mary Hemings. And so going back up to that Hemings family tree, um, you see that Critta Hemings, who uh, we had talked about as inheriting the land and living um, in a free state uh, out, out by where the center is, um, that her sister, Mary Hemings, is actually living here uh, in this house on the corner of 2nd Street and Main Street. And her son, Joseph Fawcett, lives there for a time. He's also uh, a little bit further down. He's a blacksmith by trade, um, and he is free, but his son is not. Um, he makes several uh, petitions to try to uh, gain his freedom, to try to purchase it. Uh, unsuccessfully, John R. Jones does not uh, grant it. Um, and of course, as, as I said, Peter escapes several times and is recaptured. Um, that family home, though, on 2nd Street and, and Main um, be, is passed down several generations. And so um, it's passed down through uh, Sally Bell is uh, Mary Hemings' daughter. Um, and and she marries a, a man named Jesse Scott. Um, they have a son named Robert Scott, and that is the man. I don't know if you can see it, but the man standing in that front yard uh, is Robert Scott. And so that is the grandson of Mary Hemings. Now, he in turn uh, has a granddaughter. Uh, so his daughter, Elizabeth Scott, um, has a daughter, and uh, her name is Nanny Cox Jackson. Now, you may have heard of Nanny Cox Jackson or be familiar with the name. Um, she is the namesake, uh, among many other things, she is the namesake of Jackson Via Elementary School. Um, and so she was a career educator. She taught here at the Jefferson School. Um, but one of the interesting things, um, and, and you'll kind of see how I stumble on this in a minute, um, is looking through the property records, uh, she becomes very, very familiar, um, as does another man. Um, so looking across the street. Um, this is where the CVS is. Um, this was another uh, free woman of color named Nancy West. She marries a, a Jewish merchant named David Isaacs. Um, and together they uh, live and have children and buy uh, a bunch of property in that area, actually. Um, now, Nancy West has a daughter named Jane West, and Jane West adopts a, a, a boy named John. Um, he takes her last name and he, he becomes known as John West. Um, now, John West is the namesake for West Haven, uh, the largest public housing neighborhood in Charlottesville. He's also the namesake for West Street uh, in Charlottesville. Um, he's the birth son of Isabella Gibbons. And Isabella Gibbons is, uh, of course, the first black teacher here at the Jefferson School. Um, and she's enslaved by a, a university professor. Um, and after emancipation, she uh, begins teaching here. Um, her son, John West, uh, goes on to become one of the largest property holders, black or white, in the area. He owns half of Afton Mountain. He owns 400 acres out in Gordonsville. He owns 300 acres down in Scottsville. Um, and he owns dozens and dozens and dozens of property. Um, by the time he's 50 years old, uh, the turn of the, the 20th century, he is, uh, he is owning more than 100 properties, almost uh, 125 by our count. Um, now, one of those is very particular um, and very, very special. Um, so so you'll see here in the lower left-hand side of your screen, uh, there's kind of an L, a reverse L shape. Um, now that is one of the first properties he buys. He's born in 1850. He buys this property at 20 years old. Um, you can see that same piece of property um, in that center diagram. There's a uh, reverse L uh, there. That is that same piece of property that then morphs over to your right side of your screen. Um, there's that same reverse L. So upon kind of situating ourselves and realizing, okay, what is that top street? What is that bottom street? What are we looking at? This is the formation of Vinegar Hill. So Vinegar Hill is a historically black neighborhood. And, and actually behind me, I have several pictures of it um, that uh, was the center of religious life, of cultural life, um, of benevolent societies, uh, of business, uh, of residential life uh, for, for many of, of Charlottesville's black families. Um, and this is the formation of it um, in 1870 uh, as it falls into black hands um, and, uh, and moves from there, um, we see uh, yeah, here's a picture. We see it develop into um, really the height of, uh, of Black Charlottesville in terms of, of that 20th century um, 
concentrated business, residential, cultural, religious uh, center for town. Barrett Daycare has begun there. Uh, um, many, many of the institutions that we know. Um, and this is the bird's eye view. You can kind of see um, the Albert, what's now the Albemarle County Office Building, what was then built as Lane High School uh, at the top of the screen, uh, just to orient you. Um, that street that runs up and down on the left side of your street uh, screen is uh, 4th Street. Um, and um, in the center of your screen on the very bottom uh, is Ridge Street. And today it continues on through, of course. And so um, when uh, the urban renewal plan was approved um, and the city moved forward with the destruction of Vinegar Hill, uh, it bisected the community uh, with the road that is now McIntyre Ridge Street. Um, and uh, and it, it decimated all of the uh, houses and all of the buildings that were in that neighborhood. Um, and that is a whole entirely other talk, but I did want to kind of draw that connection, right? That, that nothing of, when we're talking about all of this history, nothing happens in isolation, that it is all interwoven and interconnected. Um, and just as free and enslaved people are moving uh, in close proximity to one another um, uh, and, and in sometimes uh, close legal proximity to one another, um, that, uh, that cultural institutions are forming and taking root uh, through property ownership um, and through uh, a generational advocacy uh, that happens within the black communities here. Um, now, jumping back to that first property um, that John West bought, uh, we actually see it again. And so when the city incorporates in 1888, um, it gets its own form of government, uh, its own municipal sort of resources, water lines, sewer lines, these sorts of things. Um, it also gets its own deed books. And so these are just a, you know, a chain of title of, of who owns what. Um, and so if you look at the county, uh, at the city's deed books, the very first one is this giant tome and it's uh, deed book one, page one, and you open it up um, and you see this deed. And at the very, in the very middle, you see, I've kind of tried to highlight it there at the bottom and it says Nanny C. Jackson. Um, so this is Nanny Cox Jackson buying the same, very same property that John West had bought uh, 18 years prior in Vinegar Hill. Um, and here's a photograph of, of Nanny Cox Jackson. She, of course, goes on to become a career educator, uh, among many other things. Um, so this all is happening towards the end of the 19th century. Now, around the turn of the century, several significant things happen. Um, of course, uh, in 1898, um, we have the lynching of John Henry James um, that I imagine some of you are familiar with. This occurs out in uh, near where Farmington is today. Uh, a group of white men, including law enforcement, including um, uh, attorneys um, are present. A mob um, stops a train uh, that is transporting John Henry James who has been accused uh, of committing a crime. Uh, they drag him out and they lynch him from a tree. Um, this is what Dr. Douglas and Dr. Schmidt have um, and, and many others have pursued to try to get recognition from the Equal Justice Initiative. This is Brian Stevenson's group uh, based in Alabama uh, for uh, this atrocity, but also for, for looking at how um, acknowledging this history um, of extrajudicial violence uh, can coincide with the legal violence, uh, right? So, so looking at systemic uh, and structural racism in the light of a deeper historical narrative around violence. Um, is really how those two coincide. And it's just four years after uh, that lynching that uh, the statewide constitution uh, gets, re gets rewritten and, and instated. Um, and among other things, it institutes a poll tax. So it institutes a, a, a fee in order to register to vote. Uh, it institutes literacy tests and it institutes a, a property requirement. Um, so overnight, it drops the number of eligible voters throughout the state, uh, number of black eligible voters um, from about 148 8,000 all the way down to less than 15,000. Um, this is a huge blow because it is during this, this period of post reconstruction um, into um, the early onsets of Jim Crow uh, that African American families and, uh, and institutions are able to um, have, have access to resources in ways that they'd been prevented up until this point. Um, and so this uh, effectively sweeps all of that progress right out from under them um, and takes their power to uh, politically push all of these mechanisms and these systems and structures um, away from them and, and limits it to a very few uh, individuals here. 
uh, 1912, 10 years later, um, the city passes an ordinance that uh, is a, uh, a racial um, ordinance uh, looking at who can own what in terms of property. And so this says that if you're white and you live on a majority white block in Charlottesville, it's actually illegal for you to sell or rent your home to uh, any, any black family or person. Um, and they, they do that, you know, um, uh, the the opposite as well, saying if you're black and you live on the majority black uh, block, uh, that this is uh, illegal to for you to sell or rent your home to a white person. Um, in effect, this is um, you know when you look at this ordinance and you go through the the minute books of the city council, uh, you see that the mayor actually vetoes this ordinance. And at first blush, you you know I think I at least wanted to believe that maybe this was out of some moral compass or a conscience. Um, and lo and behold, it turns out that our white mayor at that time owned extensive properties in black neighborhoods, um, and that this would in effect uh, uh, force him to sell and or to uh, give to a proxy uh, for for a period um, so that he legally was not in ownership and violation of this ordinance. The city council says, we understand why you're voting against this, why you're vetoing it, but we really want to enforce this. And so the entire white city council uh, overrides his veto and it's enacted from 1912 to 1917 when the Supreme Court, so we're not alone in this, I should say. So Baltimore is doing this, Richmond is doing this. We're just following suit uh, in many respects. Uh, um, and so, you know, very much, you know, we have to put these, I'm not saying it's a passive endeavor, it's a very active endeavor, but it's not something that we originated. Um, we are taking language from these other cities and putting it into our, our city laws. Um, so 1917, uh, people are challenging this um, all the while. And uh, in 1917, it makes it to the Supreme Court, to the US Supreme Court, um, and they issue a, a pretty instrumental decision that says this is unconstitutional, you cannot do this. Um, but that does not prevent people from uh, restricting land in private contract. And so if I sell my property uh, to, uh, to somebody who's looking to buy a property, I can insert language uh, like the following into a deed. Um, so as many of you probably know, a deed is just a bill of sale. Um, most times it is looking at, you know, the who, what, where, how much of a property. Um, and within that can be restrictions. And so this restriction says it is also agreed that this land is not at any time to be sold to or owned by Negroes. Um, now, this is a, a large piece. Of, uh, of, of many properties, but initially it was um, two plantations that are just northeast of the downtown Court Square area. Um, and this is what's now known as the Martha Jefferson neighborhood and Locust Grove neighborhood. Um, in 1897, a group of white developers and city leaders um, pool their resources, they buy this property, uh, and they subdivide it into 140 parcels. Um, and each of those parcels has a deed, a bill of sale attached to it. And in that is this racist covenant, this uh, restriction restrictive covenant um, that says no, nobody other than white people can actually live here. Um, this is not unique to Locust. It's, it's one of the earliest examples in Charlottesville, but definitely not alone. Um, so here you have uh, at least another 90 properties in Meadowbrook Hills uh, that all have racist covenants attached to them in, in the 19-teens. Uh, 1923, this is part of Fry Springs on the south side of town. 1926, uh, this is Rugby Hills. Um, you see there are several uh, iterations of rugby uh, subdivisions that are going in throughout this time. 1927, this is again on the south side of town over by Cherry Avenue. Um, 1927, again, this is Park Place, this is our Park Plaza, this is just north of downtown. Here's an interesting instance. It's not only racistly restricted in terms of looking at who, uh, you know, Caucasian versus uh, black may own it, but it's also, if you look at number three, it says no building costing less than $5,000. Um, and so what, what we'll see a little bit later on is that you know, 1968, the Fair Housing Act makes all of these covenants null and void. It says this is unconstitutional. You cannot do this. You can't discriminate on the basis of race. Um, but what it doesn't do um, is it, it doesn't look at all of the other mechanisms by which the same objects can be accomplished. And so what we see happen throughout the U.S., and many people smarter than I have actually written whole books and looked at this, is the adoption of these restrictive ordinances into zoning code. Um, and so this is how whole city codes 
systems are built is looking at restricting use, restricting uh, space, uh, restricting um, uh, the amount of money that a property must or a building must be uh, worth to be constructed on it. Um, so it's just interesting to see all of these private uh, contracts that have this language. Slowly, everything gets stripped out and put into city zoning ordinances, um, with the last remaining piece being that of race. And it takes the Supreme Court um, to rule on it in 1948. Even then, that just prohibits federal involvement. And ultimately, it's the Fair Housing Act that does away with it in 1968. Um, but we'll just go through a couple more just to kind of give you a sense of the scope of what, we're, what it is we're looking at throughout all of Charlottesville. Uh, this is Lyons Place, again, just north of downtown 1930s. This is Overhills off of JPA, uh, in, off the south side of the university. Um, this is off of JPA as well, um, 1936. This is another subdivision of rugby. Um, that said property or any part thereof shall not be sold to or nor occupied as owners or tenants by any person not of the Caucasian race. Uh, 1941, this is the northern part above the bypass of Locust Grove Extension. 1947, again, this is uh, Monroe Park. Um, so, I, you know, we could go on and on. These were all um, deeds that uh, subdivisions that had these restrictive deeds um, that I found just going to the Admiral County Courthouse knowing, you know, roughly when these plats were issued with these maps of subdivisions when they were originated um, and so i would look at them and lo and behold would find all of these restrictive covenants um, and so i was working with dr douglas by this point on on a couple of other projects and so i brought it to her and she said let's let's apply to the charlottesville area community foundation because i think there's something more there um, and so we did and um, we received a grant uh, a very very nice grant to get started and um, we said okay we need to figure out what it is that we're dealing with we we need to you know open our arms cast our nets so to speak uh, around all of the material we can't just do a spot check we have to really be thorough and systematic about it um, and so with that we formulated uh, memorandums of understanding with both the city and the county clerks and we got a, a, a total of about 303,000 pages worth of uh, property records that stretch all the way back to 1888 uh, and go to 1968 um, and uh, it's through it's through all of this so um, you know I've talked a lot about about the city, but of course, we're looking at the county as well. Um, this is the, all of the properties I actually just showed you. Um, I would say 80% of them were actually in the county when I showed them to you. So through the process of annexation, those properties then became city properties, but at the time they were in the county. Um, so it's, it's imperative to look at both in, in, uh, in their context. Um, and then what we do is we scan them through with optical character recognition. So this allows you, I don't know if you've ever brought up a, a PDF on your computer and, and you know search for a term um, but this is what allows that to be possible. So we can cert we can pull out terms uh, such as Caucasian or race, um, anything we want. Um, so this really makes those records come to life because up till now it's been you know people you know with their index finger <laughs> searching through it, um, and it's very laborious, very very time intensive, um, and this makes that uh, not only 100% reliable but also a little bit speedier. Um, and there's there's a real you know obviously this is very uh, interesting to me and, and to, to, to some others, but um, there's a real um, historical need for this. So I imagine a, a lot of you have heard of this term redlining. Um, redlining maps were issued by the Homeowners Loan Corporation um, in the, the 1930s and 1940s. Um, and how they got their name was, um, this was a, a federal um, kind of sidearm uh, organization that said, uh, we need to assign risk levels to neighborhoods and properties so that banks, this is coming out of the depression, remember, so, so that banks uh, know what kind of risk they're, they're uh, facing when they lend money to individuals. And so they went through and they issued letter grades, A, B, C, D, and to those letter grades, they attach uh, colors, uh, green, blue, yellow, red, um, and almost universally throughout the whole country, for every one of these maps they produce, the African-American neighborhoods were outlined in red uh, as being the most uh, high risk or hazardous. Um, so this prevented um, 
uh, hundreds of thousands of black families from uh, from ever uh, securing mortgages with a federal backing. Um, and on the inverse of that, it allowed um, millions of white Americans to become first time home buyers um, because not only were those rates secured by the federal government, but they were often at, at really uh, good rates. And so they were able to afford them. Um, so this is where that term comes from. And uh, sh they only did these maps for cities of significant size. Um, so I believe it was 50,000 people or above, uh, you know, give or take. And Charlottesville was not that populous at the time. Um, and so we did not get one of these maps. Um, now, historically, looking back and knowing what we know now, these maps are important because they, they're a breadcrumb trail of sorts. So they allow us to make connections between um, generational wealth, between uh, one's ability to own and pass down property, um, and looking at the historical systems that were put into play very intentionally. Um, now, we know that all of this occurred uh, in various ways here in Charlottesville. We know that through uh, oral history, through, through anecdotal experiences that have been shared through generations, um, but we don't have a key. We don't have that that map. And so what we're doing with this project of looking at all of these racist covenants is looking to create that map. Um, because it's out of that map that we can then begin to make connections to our present day. Um, and as we see with COVID, we see that it's negatively affecting uh, black and brown families and people uh, at far uh, more negative rates than white people. Um, that that and, and I imagine that I won't bore you with, with all of the details I'm sure you've been reading for the last six months about why that is, that that is not something that just happens, that is not, has anything to do with uh, personal agency, that these are very much uh, our systems at work um, and that they were designed to, to benefit and to neglect individuals in this way. Um, we've known this, again, anecdotally for generations here, um, that our healthcare system was not set up, that the university did not accept black patients uh, until, you know, very recently um, in, in the grander scheme of, of medicine that's been practiced here. Um, and, and so what's been interesting is to see the data and to see the studies that have come out that support these anecdotal realities that people have shared over their lives and through their parents' and grandparents' lives. Um, and one in particular, my mother has worked in public health for, for a lot of her uh, life, and um, she, she used to uh, help run the Women and Infant Children program here. And so she would be constantly interacting with new mothers. Um, and one of the, the more glaring statistics was looking at the infant mortality rate. Um, and you see that the study that is on your screen right here is looking at it's more than double uh, for black women as it is for white women. Um, and of course, this isn't unique to Charlottesville. This is happening all throughout the country, but it is very literally happening in our backyard uh, as well. Um, and it's not just isolated to health outcomes in terms of uh, access to care. It's also linked to life expectancy. Um, and so what, I, what I've been doing and, and looking at is um, where are these census tracts? So, you know, each census tract has a number. Um, looking on a map geographically, where are those? Uh, the historically black ones, uh, the, that 73.7 years and that 76.4 years, those are the historically black neighborhoods uh, that encompass those census tracts. Um, the 82. And the 81.3, uh, those are historically white and were racistly restricted. So you see that there is actually a correlatory value between where one lives and how long one lives. Um, that that is uh, that is something that again has played out over time. This is not just a, you know unique to this snapshot that um, that we're seeing this. Um, it also occurs in our educational system. Um, you know, as, as people have been fighting this. Um, you know, almost since Brown vs. Board of Education in 1954, that, that this has been an ongoing fight of access to resources and opportunities of how do we advantage, uh, you know, black children in the same way that uh, we do white children. Um, I think we saw this really play out in 2018 with the ProPublica New York Times article of looking at tracking. Um, I know that Dr. Atkins uh, has formed, a, you know, an equity committee and that um, uh, an old friend of mine, Denise, uh, Johnson has been looking at this as the equity officer for the, the city schools, um, but that this is uh, hugely problematic, again, not just in, in, in Charlottesville, um, but very much, you know, we are not outside of, uh, of these inequities that occur within our educational system. 
Um, it also occurs in our criminal justice system, of course. Um, these uh, studies started to come out in the early 2000s um, and, and really got underway in you know, 2011, 2012, um, looking at kids and the rate at which they come into contact with law enforcement. Um, and so um, they were finding that you know, black youth interact negatively with, you know, they have negative outcomes, whether it's an arrest or a stop and a frisk, uh, whether it's getting uh, probation or whether getting that probation revoked, um, that, that these outcomes affect black and brown kids at a rate three to four times as high as white children. Um, and uh, now we're, as a city, studying the adult system. Uh, you know, there's a certain... Um, it's hard to get all of the data. There's a lot of different data streams. And so there's a certain sort of, uh, you know, kind of speed bump uh, that has arisen around that. Um, but uh, of course, as, as we all are coming to understand, this has been longstanding and um, it is uh, very much uh, endemic as to part of this system. Um, and uh, we, uh, I, I work as a journalist, I, I work with a lot of different partners. Um, and so I, I worked on a series um, early in the pandemic with Vinegar Hill Magazine and Charlottesville Tomorrow um, to look at social determinants of health and how they, they are playing out in racial uh, terms throughout Charlottesville and throughout the pandemic. And one of the partnerships that we then uh, created was with the UVA Equity Center. And we had had, through um, the Freedom of Information Act, uh, a local attorney, Jeff Fogel, had, um, had gotten a lot of uh, stop and frisk data over the last probably 10 years. Um, and so we started uh, talking with the Equity Center about how do we how do we visualize this? Um, and here you have two examples at the bottom of your screen. You have the Ridge Street Prospect Orangedale neighborhood, which is a, a majority black neighborhood on your left. And you have the Martha Jefferson Locust Grove neighborhood on your right, which is majority white. Um, these are the number, the, the uh, frequency with which um, people are stopped and frisked in those neighborhoods. Um, this is what they mean when they say over policing. This is the reality that that looks like in terms of spatial uh, uh, representation. Um, and so this is, uh, again, an effect and an impact of racially segregating one's neighborhood, um, that there are very few black and brown people who are living in these majority white neighborhoods for a reason um, that this traces back and that this is part of the outcome of that um, in looking at how policing and uh, where one lives, where um, it, this is probably one of the most stark examples, I think, of this disparity coming to life uh, today, and that is through the economy. Um, and, you know, to, to get simplistic about it, obviously, there are kind of two streams of, of, uh, of economics. There's the income, what one earns, how one makes a living, and then there's uh, generational wealth, right? What one inherits, how, how one, uh, you know, talks about getting uh, amassing position in life um, through previous uh, earnings, uh, previous family earnings. Um, so this top uh, infographic is looking at from 2012 to 2016, um, when the city would put out a bid for a contract, um, whether it's, you know, looking to redesign a bridge or a streetscape, or just recently, um, we, I think, paid $1.9 million for a uh, comprehensive planning process, um, that these contracts are put out to bid. And they found that from 2012 to 2016, less than 2% of those were being awarded to minority-owned businesses. Um, and then even in 2017, it was less than 1%. Um, so the city formed a minority business um, fund, uh, and the chamber has a, uh, a black business alliance now. Um, there have been many steps taken over the last two, three years, um, but that this was a long-standing issue that uh, these systems and, and processes by which businesses were being either propped up and celebrated and, and really put forward into, um, into the cycles of regular city and municipal business were not happening at the same rates for white businesses as black businesses. Um, and then, of course, you know, looking generationally, this is a Federal Reserve study that was done in 2016. Um, and it's looking at that middle figure net worth. It's looking at that generational wealth. Um, and if you look at the median net worth for white families, it's $171,000. And for median net worth for black families, it's $17,000. So this is nationally. Um, so, you know, Charlottesville, uh, I think those numbers are uh, a little bit less, but that gap is very much present. That gap is very much the same. Um, and that's a tenfold uh, gap. 
right there. Um, and one of the major ways by which people gain wealth is through property ownership. That that is one of the number one uh, tangible assets that is able to be passed down uh, through family lines. Um, so what I became interested in as a journalist was how does do all those realities, all of those scenarios that I was, I was kind of referring to and all of those different outcomes, how do they live side by side with this reality of it being the happiest place to live, the best place to retire, the cutest small town, um, you know, the healthiest city that these seem, you know, um, maybe I, I fully believe that this is a, a reality that a lot of people experience, but I also know that uh, for, for some people that this is not. Um, that this is very much not the case. Um, and so, and I wasn't alone in thinking this and, and wondering this. And so I started to look at some of the reports that began to come out during this time. Um, and one of them was a, uh, what's called a orange dot report. And there were three of these reports that were issued by Ridge Schuyler, uh, who now is with uh, Piedmont Virginia Community College. Um, and in there, he, he basically just boils down what it takes to be self-sufficient in Charlottesville. So he initially found that it takes about $35,000 a year uh, for uh, a single parent with uh, two kids to be able to survive without any subsidies. So no housing choice vouchers, no food stamps, um, no, no government uh, subsidies, subsidies subsidization or, or interventions. Um, now that number has since increased to about $45,000. Uh, the cost of living has gone up. And these are, you know, this is for childcare, gas, food, um, all your bills, electricity, uh, phone, all of these things. Um, in this second study, there's, like I said, there are three. The second study has a footnote that is linking to the study that you see on your right. Um, and that is um, a study by an economist named Raj Chetty. Uh, he's from Harvard University and he has really devoted much of his life to looking at um, income disparities and, and wealth disparities um, and something called um, income mobility. And so he looked at, I believe it was uh, 2,734 uh, cities of comparable size throughout the country um, and found that Charlottesville was ranked 2,699th out of those for your likelihood of being born poor and getting out of poverty. So that means that things are very stagnant here, that, that things stay the same, that, that the poor stay poor and the rich stay rich, that there isn't much mobility um, in, in crossing those economic thresholds. Um, he then took all of that information one step further and he created something, I, I definitely encourage you to check it out. You can spend hours with it. It's called the Opportunity Atlas and it looks at every city in, in America, um, every you know, uh, county as well, um, but looking at all of the information that's gathered by the census. Uh, so that's everything from incarceration incarceration rates, I, I believe marriage divorce rates are in there, but what we're looking at here is household income. Um, and it breaks it down by gender, uh, by, by race, uh, all of the different metrics that the census can track for. Um, and this neighborhood in the center is, is um, a historically black neighborhood in the middle of Charlottesville called 10th and Page. Um, and you're looking at the median household income for black families in, in that neighborhood is $19,000. Um, and we're just gonna jump to the um, Northwest there. And that is Venable neighborhood. It's a historically white and majority white neighborhood. Uh, we'll just kind of, I'll just toggle back and forth um, so that you can kind of see those two. Um, they're right next to each other. Um, but if you jump to Venable, you see that median uh, household income jump about $50,000 to $67,000 a year uh, for white families. So these neighborhoods are side by side. These are experiences um, that, are, that are side by side. Um, and it's not just the city. If you look at the county, this is a median income household income for black families is 31,000. Median household income for white families is 55,000. So that's more than $24,000 right there. Um, between those two, and that's countywide. Um, so obviously you can drill down into parts of the county and to, into other neighborhoods in the city, and I definitely encourage you if you're interested to do that. Um, but one of the things that uh, Raj Chetty and others who are looking at how, you know, the how did we get to where we got? Um, how did we get here? Uh, that big, big question um, is this federal, uh, this federal rule that was issued in 2015. Um, and it says the uh, 1968 Fair Housing Act, it not only prohibits discrimination, but in conjunction with other statutes, it directs HUD's program participants. So that's municipalities like Charlottesville and Albemarle. Uh, it directs HUD's program participants to take significant actions to overcome historic patterns of segregation to achieve truly balanced and integrated living patterns, to promote fair housing choice and foster inclusive communities that are free from discrimination. So in other words, the Fair Housing Act of 1968 not only says you can no longer discriminate on the basis of race, but you actually have a, a federal obligation to undo the harm that was done. 
Um, and you know, the big question, of course, then becomes, well, how do we know the extent to which that harm was done? And that is the premise behind building the map um, of racial covenants. But that map of racial covenants can't operate in a silo. It can't operate alone. And so we're actually adding a second layer on top of that racial covenant map. Um, and that is uh, to be found in the city council minutes. So the city council has uh, kept minutes of its ongoing in its, its proceedings uh, over going all the way back uh, to its original formation in 1888. Um, and so we have digitized all of those minutes um, and with that digitization we can then comb through them um, and with that information we put it into a spreadsheet and we're working with the University of Virginia the, um, the urban planning students there at the architecture school um, to to really uh, you know break all of this down into a spreadsheet and then attach each a uh, petition for a water line, each petition for a sewer line, each um, granting of a paved street um, to a spatial ID so that we can actually see the evolution of how water lines uh, uh, swept and crept all throughout the city through for all time. Um, and, and same for any other sort of infrastructure. But this second layer of infrastructure is key because we need to be looking at how these two intersect and uh, interact. And we're doing the same thing for the Board of Supervisors minutes as well. Um, because again, anecdotally, and even through the record, uh, we have instances of black neighbor neighborhoods being wholly denied all of these access to basic quality of life infrastructure. So here is uh, in 1917, uh, a neighborhood that's at the base of Washington Park, right where the uh, Trinity Episcopal Church is today, um, was a black neighborhood by the name of Kelly Town, uh, still still known that way to some, but but not to all. Um, and this neighborhood asked, it petitioned the uh, city government for an extension of a water line. And it says it's been considered and estimates made. And the conclusion reached by the superintendent and myself is that the line would not prove a paying proposition. And again, this was not unique. We knew this happened regularly. So this is what this information will be telling us is like, you know, were they totally denied or was this a five, 10, 15 year delay? Um, and it wasn't just 1917. Here's another instance from uh, the, the black newspaper here in 1953 um, that's talking about Skanks Branch. Again, going through 10th and Page. And it's talking about this um, body of water that is the largest health hazard uh, for people in that neighborhood. Um, and that if you continue through uh, the black neighborhood into the white neighborhood, that that same body of water, that same Skanks Branch is enclosed in jumbo sized pipe. Um, and that this is a plea for the city to, uh, to uh, uh, honor the request of residents and their health um, by enclosing that and, and submerging that. What do you think happens to your home's value if you get a water line or a sewer line uh, as, as you know, a first time home buyer in 1920, 1925, 30? Um, yeah, I would, I would imagine that it goes up in value. Um, and so uh, that is going to be the third layer of this map. So it'll be the racist covenants, it'll be the infrastructure, and then the home valuations to see what correlatory values show up uh, in looking at that. Uh, one of the things that is, is in the center's neighborhood that um, I found interesting was just how expensive the homes are. And I know there are cheaper homes there, less expensive homes there as well, um, but that, you know, existing all throughout that neighborhood, uh, you have to be able to to afford uh you know a mortgage upwards of five hundred thousand dollars or more um and that that is uh not uh feasible for a lot of folks um and so that that may not seem prohibitive that may not seem exclusionary um on its face in terms of prohibiting somebody by race um, but when you take the cumulative effect of discriminatory discriminatory policies and systems uh subjecting one to limited opportunities to gain capital limited opportunities to gain education uh limited opportunities to to grow that and pass that through uh generations um that that begins to look a little bit different um, there's another way that it shows up, uh, and that is through, as I said, uh, when the six, 1968 Fair Housing Act uh, got implemented, all of these city zoning ordinances began to take form, uh, incorporating many of the rules and the parameters that were restrictive in nature that uh, were at one point in private contracts in those private deeds. Um, and one of the ways that we see that uh, most universally throughout the whole country is through single family zoning. Um, and that is very restrictive because who can afford a, a large lot with a single family house that is, um, you know, it, it can be no less than a certain size and, um, and it, 
uh, you know, there are a lot of restrictions around, um, you know, side yards and setbacks and all of these different things I won't go into, parking requirements, um, but they uh, universally discriminate against people who, um, you know, might be able to afford to live in a triplex or a duplex or, uh, you know, rent uh, in that neighborhood. Um, and th this makes it incredibly hard. Um, and so you're seeing cities, uh, Minneapolis is one of them, uh, Portland uh, is another, Austin is another, um, that are doing away with this and at the same time incentivizing developers to try to build affordable housing. Um, so to, to uh, integrate these neighborhoods in ways that they never have before. Um, so that these longstanding effects and legacies of these racist covenants uh, will hopefully uh, allow more and more people access uh, to those living environments because we know that, that where one lives is the number one predictor of what happens of what happens to you in life. Um, and so by limiting where people can live, uh, you're limiting what their, their possibilities are for where they go. Um, and we see that these racist covenants, you know, this, this yellow is the single family zoning that we have in the city. We see that these covenants match up almost eerily. It's like one to one, um, you know, you could, you could superimpose it. So obviously we're doing our due diligence and creating these red properties. They're all the racist covenant properties, um, but then we will look at how it lines up with our zoning um, so that we can uh, inform the comprehensive plan and the affordable housing strategy. Uh, and similarly, the county is interested in this as well. Um, we are always excited to share this, um, you know, especially with you, but, but also with students. Um, and, and as a, a child that came up through the public school system here, I did not learn much, if any of this. Um, and so I'm really passionate about sharing it and, <clears throat> excuse me, about giving students and children access to make discoveries and connections that I never would, uh, because they really will take it to that next step that, that we all need. Um, and so just arming them with the tools of how do you parse this very heavy legalese jargon? Um, how do you go through deed books and look at a chain of title? Uh, how do you do genealogical research and looking at your family tree? Um, all of these things are very much is, is what the Heritage Center is, uh, is about. And so we've, been, we've had the pleasure of, of speaking to and engaging about 500 students last uh, semester. And even with COVID, we're trying to work digitally and really arm teachers and students with a lot of this information just uh, through a digital platform. Um, I, would, uh, I would love to go on and on and on about um, how you can get involved. Um, but I will leave that, you know, maybe for a subsequent talk or, or, um, or even over email. I'm happy to, to converse over phone or email with anybody that's interested. But the simple version is mappingseville.com. Um, if you click that red get involved button, it will send you on that website. You can look at all of, I, we do blog posts, so guest blog posts of, of different neighborhoods of looking at the deep history of, um, you know, similar to how, how we kind of started looking at Belvedere is that, you know, deeper history there. Um, very similar. We go from that deep past all the way to the present in uh, in several neighborhoods. Um, and so we're, we're updating that. But if you hit that get involved button in the very middle, it'll take you to this page. And this is uh, where a lot of the work gets done. And so on the left hand side, you will get a deed. And on the right hand side, you'll get a series of 10 questions. Um, and how you answer those questions is by reading the deed and pulling out the information. When was this written? Okay, I'll search for the date and insert that. And what that does is it allows us on the back end to take all of that information and tag it with a spatial ID and then it comes to life on the map. Um, and so this will be an exhibition here at the Heritage Center. It'll be on the first floor when you come in uh, by the elevators. It'll be a digital display wall. Um, it'll be accessible online as well, of course. Um, but all of these layers and all of these uh, individual properties, you'll be able to look at your own property or you know properties you're familiar with um, and again make connections that we will never have made um, and look at pre pre-crafted narratives so what is the role of the banks uh, you know if we don't have a redlining map where people racistly discriminated against with mortgages the answer is yes but we'll show you how um, we'll also go walk you through the the history of housing policy nationally and how it played out on a local level uh, the history of the NAACP and black political organizing that resisted this uh, legally and 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 uh, vocal um, in many ways. Um, the first black families to move into these historically white and restricted neighborhoods. Um, you know, all of these stories will be brought to life in that exhibit uh, down there. And so uh, as we progress, just know that that is uh, one of the end goals. So not only curriculum in schools, but also uh, exhibits here at the Heritage Center. Um, and so with that, I will stop sharing my screen and, and pass it back to you all. Um, but I hope I'm doing okay on time. Um, let me see if I can do it. All right. Thank you all for uh, for your patience and listening so 
so wonderful. <laughs> I feel like uh, I want to, yeah, I feel I must, people must have some comments, right? Yes, there are several. Ina, do you want to unmute yourself? Now? Okay. Yep. Jordy, that was awesome. And I hope everybody who's listening is now woke. <laughs> okay. Um, there are lots of questions, lots of chatting going on, and I'm really happy to say that um, Dr. Andrea Douglas is online. She's been answering a lot of the questions as we're going along. So that's really fun because I've been trying to connect to her for a bit. Um, so let's see what we've got going here, Jordy, that hasn't been answered. <laughs> yeah, it seems like a lot of it is. It's a, it's a lot of it. Let's see. Um, all right. Mm, okay, not that. Enid, I have one while you're looking. Okay, well, okay, go ahead. Uh, how did John West acquire so much property when he was so young? Ah, that's a great question. So um, in Jane West, um, uh, in her will, uh, th this is his adopted mother, he was given uh, a little bit of property and a little bit of money. Um, and so it, that was his first investment. Um, you know, that was his first kind of capital that he used. Um, he also worked as a barber. And so he had um, at least two, maybe three barber shops throughout the city um, that uh, one was for black people and one was for white people. Um, and, uh, and so that is how he, he made a lot of his money. Um, you know, this is speculation solely. Um, we, we haven't unearthed this, but I have to believe that working in a barber shop, uh, one is naturally put into contact with a lot of very useful information uh, in terms of that is, you know, for, for many people that is church, right? That is, that is where you go to convene and commune with, uh, with others and share information that, um, you know, I think is, is very useful. Um, and so I have to believe that that must have played a role, but exactly how, um, you know, we're, we're still unearthing it. I think once we get the, the cumulative, um, data collected of all of his properties, we can then begin to see patterns of who is he selling to, who is he buying from. We know that in pieces. Um, I know uh, some of the homeowners right now that, that own properties that he uh, sold uh, many, many years ago, but that, that they live there. And so I've been getting, talking with them about how did they get access to it. So um, we're building that picture. But initially, it was through that little, little bit of money and property that uh, Jane West gave him. Oh, great. And then there's one um, from Elizabeth. If racial covenants are illegal now, why do they still show up in deeds? Shouldn't people ah, be allowed to have these removed without paying legal fees? Yeah, no, that's a great, that's a great question. Um, and uh, so there, there's kind of two parts to that. One is that people, uh, I believe in Richmond, I, I spoke with them last year ahead of the General Assembly, are working to make it um, uh, cost effective. So in order for a deed to be transferred, you either need to, um, you need to pay a lawyer, uh, you need to, to file it with a court, um, and uh, that language is then turned over into a new, day, new deed. Uh, awfully, uh, often that's done through, um, you know, making a trust. Um, so, you know, transferring ownership from a private person into a trust, um, or just a sale, right? Transferring ownership from one person to another. Um, and then that language is carried over. And so in the 50s, uh, we actually are starting to see people intentionally write in um, that they want all of the racist covenant language stricken from their deed. Um, now, they, for, and I don't know the mechanics well enough to know why this happened, but, but the racist language is still there in the deed, and yet they are referencing it saying that this is stricken. Now, subsequent deeds then do not have it, but that deed, it, it still did. Um, and so uh, not all, you know, I think it, it, it took a deliberative sort of act on uh, the, the party of either the seller or the buyer to strike it from uh, the deed. Um, but that now they're trying to create that process so you don't have to hire a lawyer, so you don't have to pay any fees with the court um, so that you can just do this uh, naturally. Um, you know, for me, 
I'm, I'm always kind of looking at process and how people process information. And, um, you know, I would love to build in an educational component to that uh, so that people just, you know, they don't get to just check a box and get rid of the deed if, if they are white and they're homeowner and they're looking at the history of their neighborhood, it might be useful to put that into context of how did it get this way. Um, and so uh, certainly for black homeowners, I think it's a different story. And, and um, you know, I, I've talked to some people who have bought homes in the Richmond area that, uh, you know, looked at their deed. Uh, these are these are black homeowners and looked at their deed and saw it and, and were like, oh, what did we just do? Um, you know, they're trying to trying to kind of grapple with that history. But um, but yeah, so that is that is why it's still there. Um, you know, in effect, the Supreme Court in 48 and the Fair Housing Act said you can't do this any longer, but it didn't say anything about it just said it's not enforceable. Um, so that these these this language is still there, but it's just not enforceable. Um, so should it, yeah. Another question, Jordy, is it true that the covenant still exists for Farmington? Is that true or not true? I mean, again, yes, there, you know, I've seen property deeds that still have them. Um, you know, Farmington, I haven't really dug into it a whole lot, but I, I found the original and it's in 1930. Um, and, you know, in many of these deeds, um, it was hard to tell from the slides, but in many of these deeds, uh, they bury these, this racist language, uh, you know, towards the end, um, or at least towards the bottom third quarter of it. Um, with Farmington, you know, so that they'll be listed out and there, there it is with the racist language. With Farmington, they had 10 covenants. So, 10 restrictive clauses and the very first one is about race um, and so uh, they they very much were uh, kind of the flagship of you know saying you know white people you'll be safe here we will never allow black people to live here or you know that sort of thing it was very much in their marketing of how you know even in advertisements there's there's that coded language uh, of the time if you see it in daily progress that there's very much um, that that kind of advertising there so um, yeah they, they still exist I don't you know again they're not enforceable so it's not um, entirely yeah. germane but uh, they are there let's see are there any others? Let me see. Do you have any thoughts about how to repair all of this? You mentioned incentivizing low income housing. Any other thoughts to share? Yeah, I mean, well, so the big one is is looking at the legacy of zoning, um, specifically single family zoning, and um, that that access to neighborhoods should not be based on on race, nor should it be based on generational economic. Um, you know, access to, mm -hmm. to capital. Um, and so, so that's, that's the biggest one that I've seen um, play out. It's no small um, accident that we are the third city in America to ever take this on in terms of mapping and, and really uh, indexing, archiving all of our, our racist covenants in our property. So the first was Minneapolis and the, the second was Washington, D.C. Um, mm -hmm. Seattle did a little bit, um, but, but they didn't do their whole city, uh, not nearly. Uh, so they did one neighborhood. But, um, but Minneapolis, like I said, it was, is one of the you know the cities that's really pushing that uh, that whole uh, dismantle single-family housing and um, and then put I think they put 50 million dollars towards building affordable housing in single-family zone neighborhoods um, and so and they did that I believe last year um, and and drew on extensively the work that the team uh, mapping prejudice team had had done around this work um, of course, you know, it was a big enough city, so it did get redlined. Um, so it had a lot more going on with that, but and gentrification there is very present as well. Um, but, um, but looking at that reparative element, uh, I think, uh, you know, I'm in talks now with, with lawyers and developers and urban planners, and, um, and we're all grappling with this, you know, how do we repair that? And where everybody seems to be lining up is, um, okay, we need to change the zoning in these legacy restricted neighborhoods uh, to allow for uh, you know, a duplex or a triplex. And in, in some cases, you know, they were squeaked in there. So they're not totally, uh, they're, they're not all gone, but, um, but they're not common. And the lot sizes in some of these neighborhoods are quite large. Um, and I've talked to homeowners who are very interested in building not only accessory dwelling units, but um, you know, subdividing their property. Um, it's big enough <laughs> in some of these neighborhoods. And so um, why not? You know, we're talking about 10 square miles of a city um, and these giant apartment buildings keep getting built. Um, that's not what folks are talking about in these restricted neighborhoods. Uh, they're talking about you know, adding two, three, four here or there. Um, 
and uh, and that cumulatively that'll add up um, and hopefully alleviate uh, some of the affordable housing crisis that we're in. Right. Well, I don't see any other additional questions. Do you, Carolyn? Um, I see Andrea put that it would be great if more people got involved in documenting <laughs> deeds so information is usable in other arenas, particularly comp plans. Totally. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, yeah, as, as she indicates, we've got loads and loads to go. Um, and, uh, you know, we're, we're nearing the end with the city's deeds um, and still very much in the throes of the mapping process with them. But, uh, but we have the entire county's collection too. So uh, we will be at this for at least another year, if not, if not a little bit further. Um, and, probably uh, pick up some volunteers from this. <laughs> I hope so. I hope so. Well, <laughs> yeah. If if it, if it sounds like it, if you get whispers of to that end, I'd be happy to um, to set up a, a, a virtual sort of training. Uh, we've done those a couple times and mm -hmm. uh, to quite you know some some success. And so um, basically walk people through. It's it's not hard at all. But um, sometimes it's nice to just have somebody to ask questions to. And um, yeah, it's it's also you know people run the gamut. I know people that have uh, done this with their children. Um, um, that they have, you know, kind of taught them English and taught them, you know, how to read, reading exercises. Um, right. I know people that do this instead of Sudoku. Uh, so it's kind of, you know, one yeah. of those kind of relaxing exercises that mm -hmm. uh, where you feel like you've contributed to something and learned something maybe. And, um, and so, uh, you know, for, for different people, it scratches different itches, but um, yeah. I would love and appreciate uh, any help that people can give. Well, I think you might get some as a result of this presentation. There's, I know there's one person who did say, um, is there an opportunity? And the, opp the answer is yes. And then for okay. other people who have asked about um, uh, future, you know, being able to get access to this in the future, um, I think Carolyn did mention that this will be on YouTube. And so you'll be able to access it. And um, Jordy, what can I say? <laughs> I called on you, you and you said, sure. <laughs> I really, really appreciate it. Thank you so much. It was an outstanding presentation. Oh, thank you very much. It's my pleasure. Thank you. I know you can't, there's a, there are 89 participants left. We were up to as high as 114. Oh, I know wow. you can't hear the clapping, but there's plenty of that going on. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Actually, not to contradict you, Enid, but it was 122, so. Just, oh, okay. <laughs> just awesome. I'm all about numbers. That's great. I, I, I actually do have one quick question before oh. I put up the poll for Jordy, if that's okay. Um, my husband is a, a middle school teacher, and if he were to incorporate any of your information into his uh, curriculum, what would be the most important thing you think that young people here in Charlottesville, a couple, you know, couple bullet points, what they should know? Great ah, that's a good question. Um, you know, so in working directly with teachers, uh, I find that I, I tend to defer to them to give me some benchmarks of, so for instance, I'll give you an example. We worked with, um, I believe, four different 11th grade classes at CHS uh, and their core requirement, their English classes. And so their core requirement was to read A Raisin in the Sun. Um, and I don't know how recently people have read that, but it's talking about Chicago's uh, housing market in the backdrop of that whole, that whole story is looking at discriminatory policies and, and practices within Chicago. Um, and so this project just fit hand in glove in with that um, to say, you know, it wasn't just Chicago, this place that many of you probably haven't been. It also happened right here, um, and so we can we can weave that story of um, you know of these two these two things that were happening here: black property ownership and and organizing in the face of, and then show that discrimination as it occurred uh, to try to restrict access. Um, and so, middle schoolers, it's um, you know we've had some success uh, with mapping. They start to get into GIS at that age um, and looking at you know geospatial sort of technologies, um, and so that would be a, a definitely an avenue in uh, to that we could um, we could work on that with them um, you know but if it's just looking historically of what to include I would say just the the mere fact that these covenants exist um, you know that that these racist policies uh, were enacted for long periods um, and that uh, and that their legacies really are here um, and then kind of expand out from there but that would be the the central key tenant I think Thank you so much. I also want to say, you know, you know, we had to scroll through a lot of thank yous, amazing presentation and all that yes. to dig in to get to the questions. So mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. very, very many people have appreciated the depth and breadth of your knowledge and your time. So thank you.
Oh, thank you. No, oh, it's quite humbling. <laughs> well, I hope that everybody enjoyed this evening, and I'm going to remind you. Um, I can't say thank you enough to Jordy, and I'd like to remind you that next Wednesday, same time, same Zoom, um, we're going to hear Lisa Drain and friends, and she'll remind us of that dreadful summer of 2017 and bring us up to where we should be headed today. And thank you so much for attending, and thank you for filling out our survey. And we'll see you. Jordy, are you going to join the rest of the presentations? I'm going to try. Absolutely. Yeah. Great. Okay. Because we need everyone on there, especially when questions come. <laughs> okay. Thanks so much, everybody. See you guys. I'm signing off.